Just a short message to wish all our listeners a great 2022. We have a variety packed program lined up for this year. Now, if you've enjoyed our content, I'm asking you to consider making a small one off donation to help kickstart the show in 2022. Think of it a bit like that cheeky fiver your gran would pass you on Christmas Day or your birthday. It's just a few clicks at coldwarconversations.com slash donate. Now back to your episode. When, when you see a young, uh, a young Vietnamese who's, who's now dead and through his wallet, you see the pictures of what was either a girlfriend or a fiance or, or a wife, who, who knows? You, know, you, you cannot help but think that uh, that war is so is so inhuman. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Bob Wallace joined the U.S. Army in 1968 as a reluctant conscript. He describes the draft process and his attempts to avoid conscription. After basic training, Bob is assigned to a long-range reconnaissance and ambush unit who operated in five- or six-man teams in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. We hear of the reconnaissance and ambush tactics, as well as some poignant memories of those that didn't make it back. Now, this podcast relies on listener support to enable me to continue to capture these incredible stories and make them available to others for free. You can support my work and help me to preserve this Cold War history via one-off or monthly donations. This is Mark in Nuego, Michigan, USA. I support the Cold War Conversations podcast because this is fantastic history, textured, in-depth, real stories, first-hand accounts uh, of a defining period in our history. For those of us who grew up with it, uh, we understand how frightening it was, and it is very positive that we can preserve this for future generations. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate to see the options. Do join our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Now, back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Bob Wallace to our Cold War Conversation. My early life, the first 18 years, was spent on a Kansas farm. Uh, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather uh, were farmers in north-central Kansas. Uh, this is a, a very rural county, uh, so I, I grew up on the farm doing the usual farm chores of a uh, farmer's uh, life, which included uh, chickens and pigs and cattle and horses and uh, sheep and uh, all, all the kinds of crops that were necessary to feed them through the winter, alfalfa, corn, uh, wheat, and, and the like. So, uh, so that was my early, early my childhood. It was uh, formed by my association with the church, my family's association with the church, by uh, attending a small high school and uh, by uh, playing sports, uh, all all the sports. Uh, there were so few kids in the in the high school that all the all the men, all the boys played football, baseball, and basketball, and then we played baseball through the summer. Uh, so it was uh, it was one of those kind of uh, farm farm lives that uh, often are uh, written about in in books. Uh, Little house on the prairie. <laughs> uh, might might be a good uh, good good starting point for anyone who wants to uh, is interested in and wants to uh, learn about a life on 
uh, in, in rural America. Sounds quite quite idyllic, Bob. So how, how did uh, the, the U.S. Army get into your life then? Uh, the U.S. Army was an intruder. Uh, I was uh, graduated from high school in 1962, immediately uh, enrolled, went to uh, Ottawa University, which is a small liberal arts of Baptist college in eastern Kansas, graduated from Ottawa in 1966. Uh, the Vietnam War had now picked up a lot of steam after the 1964 election and uh, Johnson uh, President Johnson putting a large number of troops into Vietnam in 1965. The, uh, the draft was uh, uh, a major topic of conversation, I think we could say, uh, among those of us who were in, in college at the time. And uh, I, I don't want to claim the title of being a draft dodger, but I certainly was very happy to enroll at the University of Kansas and the uh, pursue a, I thought at the time, uh, doctorate degree in political science. Uh, now that, uh, that afforded me another uh, deferment, year-to-year deferment. So uh, I, was, I was deferred a year for my first year in graduate school. I uh, re- received a deferment for my second year in graduate school, I thought. Uh, it was in April. I recall this clearly of 1968 that uh, I was looking for my next deferment, of course, for the for the following year. And I received a letter from my draft board in Lincoln County, Kansas, which said, uh, you are now classified 1A. Uh, that was not good news, Ian. Uh, that was not, not good news that I thought, because that meant I was immediately eligible to be drafted. And what what was your immediate reaction to that? Were you involved politically at all at university? Was there a a strong anti-war element at your university? Uh, There were uh, anti-war elements, I think, at uh, at all universities, not so much in my undergraduate school uh, because uh, the the war really hadn't taken root uh, at the time. But uh, by uh, 66, uh, 67, uh, there was a, a fair, fairly strong anti-war sentiment at the University of Kansas. Uh, personally, uh, I, I stayed out of that. That uh, that wasn't of, of particular personal interest to me. Uh, I was far more interested in state and local government politics, uh, which was my focus, which was uh, which was my major. And uh, while at the University of Kansas, I uh, uh, did quite a bit of of work at the state legislature, the Kansas legislature, the anti-war movement. I, I, I was aware of it, but I certainly wasn't a part of it. What I do remember clearly, Ian, was the uh, speech that Lyndon Johnson made in February of 1968 uh, in, uh, when he said he would not run for re-election. Uh, that was uh, uh, that was quite a dramatic political event, at least uh, in in my perspective. And then six six weeks later, uh, I got the uh, notice from the draft board of my reclassification. And what what was your immediate reaction to that? Uh, my immediate reaction was, I can beat this. <laughs> I'm going to go uh, back uh, back to Lincoln County, and uh, the the draft board, uh, made up of uh, three men at the time in, in Lincoln County, and uh, the chairman of the draft board was a high school classmate of my father, a, lo- a local farmer also in the area, uh, so some, someone that was a family acquainted. And uh, my thought was, uh, yes, if I go and talk to the draft board, uh, tell them that I uh, have finished two years of the graduate program, it will be another two years, uh, and then I would get a, a PhD. And uh, that would be, uh, they, they would listen to that sympathetically and, and likely agree that I can continue the education. Uh, so I went 
I went home, I went to uh, the Lincoln County Draft Board and made my case. And how did that go? A very cordial meeting. Uh, I was in the courthouse in uh, Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln City is the county seat of, of Lincoln County. Now, uh, you need to uh, recognize that Lincoln County is one of those rural counties of America that has lost population in every census since 1910. Uh, the population has decreased. In 1910, the county had uh, 10,000 residents. Uh, today, that number will be about 3,000. So at the time I went to the, the draft board, there, there were probably 3,500 people in the in entire county. Uh, the draft board had a responsibility to produce uh, the num- number of uh, candidates as, as they were assigned. And in that particular year, 1968, uh, the draft board had a quota of one. Well, my uh, thought on that, I, I had done a little statistical study while I was uh, while I was in college. So, uh, st- statistically, you know, my my chances of not being that one were were pretty good. I made my case to the draft board; they were courteous to me. I said, uh, not uh, not only. Uh, was I well into the PhD program, but also when I graduated from the program, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, be a professor at uh, some of the disadvantaged, more disadvantaged colleges in the United States. So I had a social conscience as well as uh, as, as an educational goal. The uh, draft board, uh, after listening to me, asked me to leave the room. I had said, we need to uh, deliberate this. Their deliberations lasted all of five minutes when I was invited back to come. And the chairman of the board, uh, this again, I emphasize is a uh, family acquaintance, family family friend, said, uh, Bob, uh, we have uh, uh, looked at our needs. We've uh, heard what you had to say. As you know, we have a... A draft quota of one for this year. There are two people in the county, two young men in the county who are really uh, we we are considering. Uh, one is just graduated from high school, and the other is you. Uh, you've had six years of college education. The other individual has had none. In our opinion, six years of college education is enough for anybody from Lincoln County, Kansas. So, Ian, uh, that uh, was a was a pretty clear message that within uh, three or four months, I was going to be on the next bus to basic training in Fort Leonard Wood, uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, where the Army had a basic training program. And how did your mother and father react to this news? I don't recall any particular uh, reaction uh, that uh, they had. Uh, my father uh, was just a little bit older uh, uh, for the Second World War draft, uh, and he was also the oldest of a family of eight children. So he was exempted from the World War II draft, but three of his brothers uh, served uh, in uh, combat uh, assignments uh, during during World War II. Uh, uh, my mother also had uh, family who had who had been in World War II and in Korea. So I I think their reaction, uh, although they never talked specifically to me about it, was uh, this is just this is one of the responsibilities that we have as American citizens, and if the country calls you to do this, uh, you you do it. Right. Uh, uh, so uh, by uh, September of 1968, I was in, uh, I was in basic training. Uh, two months later, I was in advanced infantry training at Fort Ord, California. And on, by mid-January of 1969, uh, I was in Vietnam. 
Can you just describe what that first day was like of arriving there? That must have been quite a culture shock for you from what you were used to. Ian, I have no specific recollection of, okay. of that day. In, in fact, most of basic training and advanced, advanced infantry training, uh, those uh, 16, 17 weeks combined, uh, are, are something of a blur uh, with uh, two exceptions, I, I would uh, note. And both of those uh, came from the Ford Ord experience. I was now in advanced infantry training. There was little question about where those of us in that uh, that particular training program were going to end up. I thought that in retrospect, after having spent a year uh, in, in a combat unit in Vietnam, the training, the infantry training that we received at Fort Ord was just uh, exceptional. Uh, it was largely done by sergeants, uh, enlisted uh, enlisted guys, career uh, army people who had been in Vietnam, and uh, they they clearly knew what they were doing, and they had very strong, uh, it, it seemed to me, motivation to teach us new recruits as much as they can about what the combat experience was going to be. Uh, one of the incidents that I recall was so, so favorably uh, is that we had uh, been on an all-day exercise, training exercise, uh, that included uh, nighttime operations. Uh, it was uh, now uh, November, early December in, at Fort Ord, California. Uh, the nights get really chilly, and uh, there was a little rain that night. And uh, so it was cold. We were cold, tired, damp, and uh, all of that. And we were, we were marched back to the barracks and... Greeting us was a, were just some huge kettles of hot soup that the uh, mess hall folks had uh, provided for us. I don't know that that was necessarily part of the uh, of the standard training uh, program there, but uh, kind of being being recognized in in that way for that that night just had a uh, has left an impression on me, a positive impression about you know how, yes, the Army uh, requires great sacrifice from, from uh, those of us uh, who, who are part of it. And, and at the same time, there is also a real sense of, of caring for the troops. I can imagine that, that having a, a big impact. You said there was a, a second. The uh, second was uh, perhaps uh, less favorable, but it has, it has stayed with me as a uh, a point of, of leadership and uh, and management. Uh, uh, I I was uh, in the uh, in the barracks a uh, couple of weeks after we I uh, was assigned to to Fort Ord, and uh, probably because I was likely the oldest person uh, in that training uh, cadre. I at the time I was now uh, twenty four years old. Uh, certainly the. Uh, probably had more education. Uh, I had I had finished the master's degree at the University of Kansas, and uh, the the young uh, lieutenant uh, who was the the captain who was the in charge of the training company uh, came to me while I was standing at my bunk, and he said, uh, "Private Wallace." Uh, Put on these sergeant stripes. Uh, you're going. You're going to be the sergeant that's in charge of the twenty or so uh, people in your particular cadre. Uh, now, I didn't want to be in the army, and I certainly didn't want to have any responsibility in the army. You know, either, either one. And uh, so I said, "No." I said, "No, no this that's that's not something." I'll, Yes, uh, yes, Private Wallace. Don't you understand? This is a command, and he sort of took my arm and and uh, strapped the sergeant uh, stripes on me. I said, "Now what?" And he said, "These barracks are a mess. You know, straighten them up, and uh, we're going to have an inspection in two hours." Now. I don't think it was uh, insubordination, Ian, but I just knew 
at that particular point that this wasn't for me at all. And uh, so I, I took the stripes off and uh, I, I gave them back to him. And I said, you're going to have to find someone else to do this. Well, you know, are you some kind of a weenie? Uh, I think he used actually a more pejorative term than that. And I said, if you think so, yes, sir, I am. But I also don't take on responsibilities that I can't discharge in good, in, in fullness and, uh, and competently. And this is just not one that I would be able to do. Well, we will... I'll talk to you later. You know, you won't, we won't forget this. Uh, and I said, well, neither will I. And, and, and I didn't. Now, uh, the, the point is, uh, you know, nothing, nothing really happened after, after that. Uh, he found somebody else that was willing to do that. But, uh, but what it really uh, did, did help me under, understand was that uh, when, when folks are are asked to take on on responsibilities, uh, they need to be be intellectually, mentally, emotionally ready to uh, assume those responsibilities. Uh, otherwise, they'll, they'll do a horrible job. And I knew I would do a horrible job in that. So I, I was I was always uh, I've always thought that there are some times uh, when it's just good to turn down promotions. And I think that works in the military as well as in civilian life. Well, I, th- I, th- I think there's a there's a saying that when you're in the army, don't volunteer for anything. <laughs> uh, there, there, uh, there is that, and uh, like 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 most sayings, uh, there's there's a lot of truth to that, uh, and, and uh, there's there's also uh, probably uh, sometimes when when volunteering is good. And uh, maybe if I can give you an example of when volunteering is good, yeah. I, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. I, I spent a year in Vietnam, came back. I had about four months left to go on my, uh, my obligation. So I was assigned to Fort Hood, Texas. And, and at, uh, at Fort Hood, Texas, the, uh, uh, oh, we, were, we were being processed in and uh, Fort, Fort Hood, is an arm as an armor unit, uh, or at the time it uh, that was it was an armor unit for it for the army, and I was uh, uh, going through the processing and uh, uh, spoke with a guy who was uh, making assignments. He said, uh, "Well, uh, Sergeant Wallace, I, I looked at your record record here, and I see that uh, you're you're from the uh, university. You went to the University of Kansas." And I said, "Yes, I I did." He said, "Well, you know, I." Uh, graduated from KU as well, uh, and uh, he said, uh, "You're you you're being assigned to a particular uh, uh, particular small company in, in one of the armor units." Uh, he said, "Now, I can't uh, I can't I can't promise this, but uh, would would you be interested in volunteering?" For something other than uh, the the company that you're assigned to, uh, he said, you know, th- this company does a lot of training. It goes out uh, in the, uh, and, and uh, drives tanks around and camps at night and all that. He said, you've been in Vietnam. I don't know whether you're too interested in doing that. I said, look, I'm willing to volunteer for anything else that you might have. And uh, he said. Well, well, good. Let me let me work on let me work on this and get back to you. And so I said, fine. Uh, le- left and wondered what I had gotten myself into. Uh, next day, he came back and he said, okay, good news. Uh, I have assigned you as a as an instructor in the NCO, the non commissioned officers uh, training program here at uh, at Fort Hood, and uh, you will be teaching writing. As a, as a part of that curriculum, how does that sound to you? I said, "That's that's great." I've I've slept in on, on the ground uh, long enough, and you know now I can now I can uh, just be part of a of a training program of an academic program. That's uh, that's right down my interest. So in that case, Ian, volunteering turned out to be really good. Yeah, 
yeah, no, I think you're right there. That that one definitely definitely paid off. But let, let's just go back to Vietnam. How how did you how were you transported to Vietnam, and what what did you find that day you arrived? We went to Vietnam on a World Airways charter. I think there were probably about 220 uh, guys uh, on that on that charter. Uh, 707 uh, jet went. Uh, to Alaska, refueled in Alaska, then went to uh, Japan, refueled in Alaska, and then on to Vietnam. What I remember uh, on the flight was the courteousness of the crew. Uh, the, uh, the it was all uh, women uh, stewardesses on the on the flight at the time, and uh, they just could not have been uh, m- more more kind and. Uh, uh, just the the, ap- the atmosphere was uh, just you know, un- unbelievably positive. Landed in Vietnam, uh, the first thing that uh, you, you think of getting off the airplane that I thought of getting off the airplane, and I've uh, heard this expressed by many other soldiers as well. Uh, there, there's a sense that you're getting you might might be getting off the airplane and being shot at immediately. Well, that's that's far from the truth. That that wasn't the case at all. Uh, obviously, the planes wouldn't land if there were uh, ground fire going on. But what you did immediately face was that blast of hot, humid uh, Vietnamese uh, temperature and weather. I grew up in Kansas, so I thought it was. I knew what hot was. I knew what a hundred degree temperature day was. I never knew what a 100-degree temperature day with a 100% humidity day was, though. And I think it took me two to three weeks just to get adjusted uh, to, the, to the climate. That was the uh, most memorable and most remarkable uh, part about Vietnam uh, on, up, upon arrival. Uh, well, you know, eventually, I, I was thankful again and again that I was in Vietnam and I was sleeping in uh, wet rice paddy dikes, uh, rice rice paddies uh, and in warm temperatures rather than being having been in the Korean War where you're slogging through uh, the uh, the Korean mountains uh, in in sleet and cold rain cold cold and wet I think uh, is must be the most trying of, of all the circumstances for soldiers. Warm and wet, hey, you can get along with that. <laughs> and what what was your role in Vietnam? What was your m- mission? Uh, I was with a long range reconnaissance patrol unit. Uh, it was a ranger company uh, that was assigned to the Ninth Division. Uh, each of the major divisions in Vietnam had a reconnaissance, a ranger reconnaissance team uh, company assigned to them. This uh, had uh, about a hundred uh, uh, guys or were, were part of the unit, and we did uh, reconnaissance and, and ambush operations uh, in five or six man teams. Uh, we would usually uh, go out for. Uh, anywhere from uh, 24 to 72 hours uh, in the area that we were operating on, which was the Mekong Delta south of Saigon, uh, about uh, 70 or 80 miles. And uh, that was the patrol area that we were responsible for. So we would uh, we would uh, go out as a team, a five or six man, man team, uh, try to stay as hidden as possible, uh, as we were were doing our reconnaissance, uh, uh, once we were discovered, uh, either visually sighted or uh, ran into some enemy combat, uh, our, uh, we we weren't equipped to stand and fight. Uh, we we were equipped to run and call for evacuation, and and report what we had encountered. Uh, so uh, uh, that was that was the nature of the operations for then the next. 12 months that I was in Vietnam. I uh, was a member of a team for about five months and then became a team leader. And so for the balance of my time there, I led one of the recon teams. 
So you did get promoted in the end. I did get I did get promoted. I uh, made it all the way to uh, a sergeant to uh, to an E five. The uh, as I was leaving my last day uh, in the army at Fort Hood, Texas, the uh, captain uh, called me in. Command company commander called me in and said, "Well, now uh, uh, we sure would like you to stay, and we'll give you an immediate promotion to E six staff sergeant if you'll stay." Uh, no thanks. <laughs> They should have read your service record to uh, have the likelihood of that. Um, how did you deploy into the Mekong Delta? Were you on foot or was it helicopter? Uh, we had uh, multiple insertion mechanisms, uh, in, insertion operations. Uh, the primary one was by the helicopter, the uh, Hue- Huey helicopter. Uh, these uh, these are the standard green helicopters that one sees in all of the Vietnam movies or or photos. Uh, we would put uh, three guys uh, on uh, each side. Uh, the doors would be off of the helicopters, and uh, we we would uh, ride sitting uh, with our our feet on the skids, uh, uh, looking out the door. The op- open uh, helicopter. And as the uh, helicopter would uh, would touch down, uh, we would immediately get off and uh, begin the operation. There's a kind of a myth that as uh, these helicopters would come in, the uh, recon teams would jump off the uh, the skids. Uh, uh, not not at all. The uh, the pilots made sure uh, that we didn't uh, do anything to unbalance that uh, that chopper until it was firmly set on the ground before we got off that was uh, that was probably uh, 80% of the operations were done that way the other uh, insertion mechanisms though uh, we uh, did the uh, insertions by by boat uh, by the swift boats the mekong delta is is riveted uh, with canals. And so uh, there were uh, no, ser- several operations where we were inserted uh, just at dusk, just at night uh, uh, along the canal bank. Uh, we also walked in a few times from our, uh, from our permanent base, uh, walked out for operations. And, and then on uh, an occasion, uh, we, were, uh, we were inserted by uh, by these uh, these boats that uh, uh, that that ran across the uh, the rice rice fields, or that uh, they were called hovercraft, and we did a few insertions from those. And your role was observation, so you were concealed and looking for Viet Cong activity. Yes, we well, we were looking for any kind of uh, Viet Cong or North Vietnamese NVA North Vietnamese Army. Uh, activity, uh, whether that be facilities that they had had, uh, places where they had dug in, uh, evidences of their having uh, been there or, or preparing to be there. Uh, it was it was a combination of both recon and and ambush operations. Uh, we did uh, the ambush operations uh, frequent, frequently as well, in which we would move out and uh, move, move into an area and then set up an ambush, usually at a trail junction or along a canal, anticipating uh, Viet Cong movement uh, during the night. They, uh, that was that was a particularly significant in terms of my understanding of technology that then was influential in my later CIA career because uh, a new technology was introduced to us about three or four months after I was in Vietnam, uh, it was a starlight scope. And uh, this was the, uh, the device, the night, the night seeing device, portable night seeing device uh, that could be carried by, by troops. Uh, it, it looked like a, a telescope uh, about 14, 14, 15 inches, inches long, it weighed uh, 12, 13 pounds. So it was a heavy thing to, to carry. Uh, but this uh, starlight scope gave us visibility, gave, allowed us to have uh, visibility into the night that we had never had before. It substantially changed our 
operational style. Uh, previously, uh, because we didn't know the terrain, uh, we would have to move into an area and then set up a night location. Once we had the starlight scope, that enabled us to move during the night. We could see uh, the terrain. We could see what was in, in front of us uh, better than the Viet Cong could see what was in, in front, of, front of them. So being able to move almost at will at night gave us remarkable flexibility and added to the effectiveness of our operations considerably. I can imagine. Can you describe how how one of those ambushes would would operate, or, or one of those incidents? Uh, the uh, the team would uh, be inserted uh, just right at dusk, right at at last last light. Uh, we had the team leader would have uh, uh, previewed, surveyed the area from uh, a helicopter, an observation plane. A uh, day or two earlier, and then established, picked out a specific ambush site. Uh, so the the team uh, would be inserted at some distance from the ambush site, uh, move uh, move to that location, uh, arrive arrive there at dark, uh, uh, spread out. Uh, spread people out at appropriately appropriate distances and just wait in silence, anticipating that there would be uh, some kind of movement either on the trail or uh, some type of craft coming down the canal. How did you identify that, that the people you were ambushing were hostile? We were operating in what was known as a, a free fire zone and also a zone in Vietnam, territory in Vietnam, where there was a dawn to dusk curfew. And so the, the operating assumption was that anyone moving uh, between dusk and dawn uh, was, had a high probability of serving either as a uh, Viet Cong soldier or supporting uh, uh, Viet Cong operations. Now, there was, uh, related to that, there was also the judgment of the team, the team leader at, at any time, uh, that uh, if, you know, walking down the trail, you know, right at, uh, at dusk, there was a, uh, a woman and a couple of kids, obviously you're not going to... Mm. Uh, Pull the triggers on 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 obvi- obvious civilians or or likely likely civilian uh, non combatants, but but otherwise, uh, and I think this proved to be uh, pretty accurate through the through the war. Uh, the Viet Cong moved moved at night, and uh, uh, that's that's when they were that's when they were doing their operations, and as as a result, uh, they were appropriate targets. Did you manage to have complete surprise most of the time, or or did they occasionally ret- return fire? Uh, in terms of the ambushes, uh, uh, I would say that by far uh, uh, surprise was was uh, was affected. Now, when we were operating during, particularly during the day, uh, uh, we were subject to being ambushed as well. And uh, that that occurred on on occasion. Well, we did uh, we did lose one team early in my time in in Vietnam because the uh, uh, the team was not on an ambush operation, but it was on a recon operation, and uh, it had it had taken the usual precautions of uh, in, inserting and and moving uh, after after dark, but. But it set up an observation uh, point, uh, and uh, clearly the uh, Viet Cong had spotted them uh, moving to that observation point. Uh, uh, they they were attacked at, uh, probably uh, around midnight uh, after the after they had set up for their nighttime observation, and uh, we we lost that entire team after. You you'd 
completed the ambush. Presumably you were after documentation as well. Do- documentation and, and weapons uh, and uh, destroying supplies, yes, all of those. And what sort of documentation were they carrying? Was it maps and that sort of stuff that you were after, sort of showing their dispositions? Uh, y- yes, the, the, uh, you would get the documentation, the personal uh, documentation from them. You would get uh, potentially, you would get orders that they that they might might have been carrying. Uh, you would get communications that they might have been carrying. Uh, uh, that was uh, that was key information. Uh, being able to identify what units uh, they uh, a particular group had been associated with, uh, where where they came from, where they were headed, uh, all of that was part of the intelligence take from the ambush. Can you remember your first time under fire? I remember it uh, quite well. It was on the uh, first uh, time I uh, went out uh, as a as a new guy, first uh, first time in in a real combat role, and uh, we were uh, lined up uh, along a rice rice paddy dike again, observing an area where we thought there would uh, be potential activity, uh, and and in fact uh, there there was because uh, we began to, to take fire, uh, and the uh, fire included tracers, so we could. We could see where the firing was was coming from, but uh, it didn't uh, it didn't directly uh, it didn't come directly at us. It was it was just off a little bit. Uh, so I remember two things. One I one I remember the just like fireworks. I said it was it was almost pretty. It was yeah, again against the against the black sky. And the and the other point was the uh, frosty the. Uh, the team leader uh, said said to me, he said, "Okay, he said just you know just stay just stay down like like we are and and watch this. They don't know where we are because uh, and he can deduce that from where where their actual firing was was aimed at." And he said, "We'll just uh, stay here and watch the fireworks." Seasoned uh, seasoned soldier, obviously. A uh, sec, yes, a second second tour in Vietnam. Right. Uh, sadly, uh, uh, he was he was killed about uh, six months later, and uh, I saw so I go down to the. I, I live in Northern Virginia, uh, uh, just outside of Washington. So when I go down to the to the wall to the Vietnam Wall, I always uh, stop and see uh, by Frosty's name uh, on, on the wall as, as well as another friend of mine who was uh, from Lincoln County, uh, who was a, a pilot and, and killed in Vietnam. So these are, uh, these are, these are poignant memories when you raise the question to me. I've seen pictures of, of that memorial and it's a huge number of, of names on there. Can you remember the the first time you saw perhaps one of the victims of of one of your ambushes? Sure, uh, that uh, that was that was always uh, you know, part of part of the ambush operation. Uh, you you needed to uh, search uh, search and uh, and strip the the victims that had been had been killed had had been uh, left behind. I, I, I'm not not sure that it was a uh, traumatic uh, kind of kind of uh, experience, but uh, they are they 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 stay with you. Uh, the the carnage the carnage of war, uh, whether it's uh, one individual's or uh, the result result of a mass bombing or something like that, are are. Are human and they they are they are awful. That's there isn't any other uh, way really to describe that. And I think uh, professional soldiers, as well as those of us who are who are draftees and experience that, uh, un- understand it. If I could uh, if I could make one diversion, uh, it it is that I I think that the way uh, all of the uh, 
combat is is depicted in all the uh, video games does society uh, no no value because uh, it it uh, the the victims in in video games they either can uh, either can reappear uh, or they they have no e- emotion associated with them when they uh, when they're exterminated or or they're they're killed and i think uh, if you when when you see a young uh, a young vietnamese who's who's now dead and uh, you uh, look through his wallet uh, and you see the pictures of of uh, what was either a girlfriend or a mother or a, or a fiance or or a wife who who knows uh, you, know, you you cannot help but help but uh think that uh, that war is so is so inhuman bob i really appreciate you sharing those um in insights there i realized that that wasn't necessarily easy for you to recall that but it, it was really good to hear from you in you in your own voice your experiences there and I you you've written or you co-authored a book called Nine from the Ninth, and there's a description from it which, which I really quite liked, where the the book depicts and it says depicts moments of joy, friendship, and surprise mixed with terror, anger, and hate. Now there's almost every emotion in there, but. I guess the the joy and friendship and that closeness you feel to your comrades, and I think you've illustrated that by your um, moving account of of remembering uh, fallen comrades at the Vietnam War Memorial. The uh, book that you uh, mentioned uh, was uh, written uh, the three of us who, who became very good friends uh, in, in Vietnam. Uh, Jack Jack Beck was a uh, public affairs officer for the Ninth Division, and uh, Jack was one of those few public affairs officers and and writers who uh, went on uh, many combat patrols uh, with both our unit as well as with the uh, line unit to which he was assigned. Uh, Paul Newman, a uh, uh, kid from Cleveland, uh, self self described juvenile delinquent from uh, <laughs> Cleveland, uh, became uh, just a uh, a wonderfully uh, close friend. Uh, uh, he was uh, almost uh, almost killed. I mean, uh, we thought uh, we thought he was. We would probably lose Paul uh, when he uh, kicked a booby trap uh, in August of 1969 and then spent the rest of his time in Japan and hospital in Japan until he was recovered and released several months uh, several months later. And then myself. So the, the the three of us come from far different uh, backgrounds, but the, the shared experience of Vietnam is is such that we still stay in touch. I look forward to seeing both of them at a Ranger reunion later this year. And the the other piece of the, the three of us is that we all married ladies uh, that we knew. Uh, when we were in Vietnam, we were all single in Vietnam. We corresponded well with these young ladies, and all of us have now celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary with these spouses. Wow. Wow. That, that's, uh, that's incredible and really heartwarming as well. I like stories like that. There's further information such as photos and videos in our episode notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.
Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.